Great, let's get back on to the management of blackouts. So uh, I'm hoping over the course of the next 45 minutes or so to take you through the management of blackouts. And you know, there are all sorts of problems with the care of, of patients with blackouts. Um, there, there is a, a, a failure to take a good history in, in many instances, and a good history is essential to know what you're doing with a blackout. And there's a often in, in general practice, patients don't have ECGs as frequently as they need to do. Uh, this is a report by the All Parliamentary Group on Epilepsy, which shows that there are 400 avoidable deaths per year and 70,000 people living with unnecessary seizures. But there are also 74,000 people taking drugs for epilepsy that are not needed because they're not epileptic in the first place. And so nearly £200 million is wasted each year and all the the, the the side effects or the unnecessary morbidity that people suffer because of that. Um, EEGs are no good in patients over the age of 35, I'm told. I'm not speaking from personal experience, but uh, that's, uh, if you read nice guidance, they're no good in patients over the age of 35. So lots of patients get misdiagnosed with epilepsy and don't get their ECG done and been spotted to have heart block. And I've certainly seen patients who have been misdiagnosed as epilepsy and you've got to get a good clear diagnosis and explanation for these patients to either fix the cause or to stop the revolving doors that you can see with these patients frequently admitted to hospital. So I based this talk on the 2010 NICE guidelines on the transient loss of consciousness in over 16s. You might say that they're a little bit out of date now, but uh, I, I don't think transient loss of consciousness has really changed very much in the last 10 years. So let's start off by asking the question, what is a blackout? Well, I asked Google and I found out that a blackout was when you had too much alcohol to drink and that some people have to drink more to get the same effect as other people. And that's, of course, not what we mean by blackouts. I want to use two different terms. One is transient loss of consciousness, which I'll call T-lock, transient loss of consciousness. And the other one is what is syncope. Can anybody tell me what syncope is? So syncope, as I'm sure you're all typing, is a transient loss of consciousness due to decreased cerebral perfusion. So as a cardiologist, that's what I'm most interested in. But there are lots of different types of syncope. It could be a vasovagal cause or it could be a stokes adam type attack uh, that would suggest an arrhythmia. Uh, so stokes adam is where you fall flat on your face and break your nose, whereas vasovagal, you fall over and break your wrists. So uh, very important to take the history as I'll come on to in a second. <clears throat> Claps query cause is one of the most common uh, diagnoses or lack of diagnoses that patients come into hospital with. And it's about uh, transient loss of consciousness as opposed to, which is obviously a subset of the collapse. Many of them don't lose consciousness, but that can often be a bit unclear. So transient loss of consciousness is apparently one to three percent of any admissions and three to six percent of uh, all admissions because lots of these patients who black out get admitted. And in fact, your lifetime risk of having syncope is one in three. I don't know how many of you have had syncope. I've come very close to being syncopal, but I haven't actually blacked out. But only because I knew to lie down, I'm sure I would have done if I hadn't. Um, epilepsy is much rarer and obviously uh, there's some overlap between uh, causing loss of consciousness and you can also have psychogenic seizures which are, are rare but uh, are obviously span the, the bridge sometimes patients black out with psychogenic seizures sometimes they, they don't and there are obviously lots of other causes of collapse query cause so what are the different types of syncope? Can anybody tell me about the different types of syncope that we need to be aware of? Excellent. 
so vasovagal, which is the most common cause and um, is is so important to diagnose because it's not dangerous, although it can be very inconvenient. What are the other types of syncope? It's good, so you can have cardiac syncope. And what are the types of cardiac syncope? Uh, yeah, you can have orthostatic hypotension. Very good. So that uh, would be in the sort of neurally mediated syncope bracket rather than sort of a cardiac cause. So here's my list. <clears throat> We've got the neurally mediated types, which are vasovagal and orthostatic. Also, a very rare carotid sinus hypersensitivity. I, I don't see that very often, but you can ask the patient if they black out when they turn their head left or right. Um, craning the neck backwards might be vertebrobasilar insufficiency, which is an even rarer cause of, of, of syncope. And then there are also things like straining to pass urine through a big prostate. Often men get up in the middle of the night, go to the loo, stand up to go to the toilet and uh, hopefully lift their loo seat up. And uh, they then strain their bodies still used to lying flat in bed. They're valsalvering because they're, they're straining to pass urine. And so they reduce return to the heart even more. And, uh, and and naturally black out. So that's a, a common uh, cause of, of syncope, particularly in men, and falls under the neurally mediated bracket. <clears throat> and then you have the cardiac causes where we have the Stokes-Adams attack, where, which is uh, the bradyarrhythmias, or tachyarrhythmias. And the other one that is worth mentioning is exercise-induced syncope as a specific uh, probably I'd call that a subset of the cardiac causes. So how do you initially assess the patient? So what, if we start off with history, uh, what are the key features here that we need to, to ask? What are the key questions? How do you go about doing it? Prodrome. So prodromal symptoms are really, really important. That's probably the single most important thing in assessing the cause. Uh, we'll come on to red flags, but a prodrome is, is crucial. And you can include in that, did they have an aura? Did they have uh, funny colours in their vision? Uh, did they have a funny smell, senses of deja vu, etc.? So good prodrome. And what, what else would we be asking the patients? Yeah, the length of downtime and post ictal symptoms, very good. So does the length of the syncopal episode help us? Yeah, vasovagals should only be for a few seconds. Usually the moment they hit the deck, they start to come round. Although patients' perception of time can be very, very variable. And so a witness to the event is, is gold dust if you've got it. Um, bradyarrhythmias due to the, the or tachyarrhythmias also, they tend to be momentary. Sometimes the lack of cerebral perfusion can mean that the patient takes a bit of time to come round and may be confused and have a bit of retrograde amnesia. Um, so it can be a little bit longer, but they they'd be fairly brief. Um, obviously, seizures um, can be a little bit longer depending upon the length of the, the seizure. So, uh, but usually if they're witness, that, that would obviously be, be fairly obvious. Good. So this is, this is my list. So you want the circumstances of the event. If you've got, uh, for example, a patient who on a winter's day goes for a walk, and then goes to a pub 
has a pint of beer while they're waiting for their food to arrive, starts eating their meal and then starts feeling lightheaded, stands up and keels over. Then they've given you a full sort of house of features that give you a vasovagal type syncope. And that would be that they probably were worried they'd need the loo while they're out for their walk. So they got themselves a bit dehydrated before they went for their walk. <clears throat> It was winter, so they were wearing a coat and went into a warm pub and they probably didn't take it off because they were worried about putting it in a beer, in some spilt beer. Uh, they then drink some alcohol and send all their blood to their skin. And they then have a meal and send their blood to their stomach to digest that. Uh, all the while they're heating up and they vasodilating to try and lose the heat and they therefore black out. And that is a, quite a useful way of describing it to people if they're sort of cultural person that might go to the pub because they can very much understand that and then they can remember that as how to avoid having future episodes. Um, prodromal symptoms we've already talked about, the appearance during the event, seizure activity very useful, colour, Generally speaking, I don't think is so helpful, but sometimes people say their relative went very white, which would fit with uh, vasovagal type syncope. Uh, tongue biting uh, is useful, uh, although you can bite your tongue when you black out. Uh, apparently, um, biting the sides is more specific for epilepsy than biting the tip. I think I've got that the right way around. Um, incontinence uh, with a seizure or, or can occur with uh, any loss of consciousness. It's got more to do with how full your bladder is than uh, the exact mechanism, to be honest. Um, and confusion postictally is obviously very common, less so with a vasovagal episode. But bear in mind, if your patient is frail, elderly patient who's bordering on confusion generally, they may well be a bit confused after they've had a blackout. Injury during the event, that would point you towards a cardiac uh, type Stokes Adam attack. Mostly when patients have vasovagals, even if they don't really remember them happening, they uh, know that they need to get themselves down to the floor. We've talked already about duration. Neurological symptoms would obviously be a, 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 a big concern as to if they could be epilepsy or maybe they've had a stroke. Um, and previous episodes, ask them about previous episodes. So now we're going to examine the patient. What do you ask for on examination? So the specific features that you're looking for on examination. Well, a heart murmur would obviously be important. Uh, evidence that they're in heart failure or that they might have weakness of their heart if they've had syncope is uh, you know, important. Um, the, there's not a lot else other than obviously in neurological features. Um, and then you're looking at the ECG. The ECG is critically important. Uh, and if there's conduction abnormalities like left or right bundle branch block, uh, that together with a Stokes Adams attack is enough to get you a pacemaker. So that's really important information. Uh, if you have uh, ischemia on the ECG, that obviously would be a big concern or long QT syndrome or really any abnormality. The ECG is really important. So what are our red flags? What red flags do you look for when you're assessing these patients? <clears throat> So I've mentioned most of them already. Um, the one I haven't mentioned is a family history. But an abnormal 12 lead ECG, presence of structural heart disease or heart failure, a family history of sudden cardiac death, exertional transient loss of consciousness, and absence of prodrome are all 
really important. And I've highlighted absence of prodrome because, as I said earlier, I think that's probably the single most useful feature. Now, obviously, if it's present, I'd, I'd be more interested in the family history of sudden cardiac death than I might even be of the prodrome. But these usually aren't present. The absence of prodrome is the important one. Uh, what about for neurology? What would be the red flags there? Well, there, if you've got a history of brain injury or the history suggestive of epilepsy or new neurology, that's what would, would flag you as, as concerning. So if you have a cardiology red flag, what would you do with your patient? Do you think you'd send them go home or do you think you'd refer them as an urgent outpatient clinic or do you want to admit them to hospital? Well, the answer is admit to cardiology for assessment within 24 hours. So any one of these features plus syncope. Um, yes, so uh, I think, Rebecca, those are all reasonable suggestions. So you want to send them in and do a 12 ECG and then think about an echocardiogram, possibly a 24 hour tape. I'd rather just keep them on the monitor than necessarily do a 24 hour ECG when they're an inpatient. Uh, but we might send them home with a 24 hour tape. Uh, if they've got one of these neurological features, then they're supposed to have outpatient neurology assessment within two weeks. So these don't necessarily need to be admitted, but obviously you have to treat the patient in front of you. So features of epilepsy. Um, I'll give you these. So a bitten tongue, head turning to one side during the loss of consciousness, transient loss of consciousness, no memory of abnormal fat behaviour before or during. So there are obviously lots of different types of complex partial seizures. Um, unusual posturing, prolonged limb jerking, uh, postictal phase and confusion following the event and prodromal deja vu or so the sensation they've seen something before or jamais vu, uh, which is that they've something they've never seen before. What about the features of vasovagal syncope? So this is the important differential. The number of patients who get admitted with vasovagal syncope, I mean, maybe that's not fair because there are a thousand patients who are seen and sent home and, and just the one that actually gets admitted. But I, I do see lots of patients who are admitted and spend a few days in hospital with vasovagal syncope that I just send home when I see them. So what are the features of vasovagal syncope that make me think I can send somebody home with reassurance? Yes, very good. So an obvious trigger. Excellent uh, prodrome um, and no postictal phase. Yeah, I think, Rebecca, you've got most of them. There's just one other thing. I like three Ps. So you've got the prodrome and the uh, posture. Uh, I've given it away and the um, you know, the provoking factor, but the posture is also useful. So you don't want any concerning features uh, and you want these three factors, ideally all three, but uh, certainly uh, you want two of them. Um, patients can have vasovagal syncope while sitting, but it tends to come on when they're standing. Um, often, for example, they get up in the morning, they go downstairs and they put the kettle on and stand still waiting for it to boil. And the time they have the syncope is not when they walk downstairs because their calf muscle pump is keeping the blood circulating. It's when they stand still in the kitchen for a minute while their body's still getting used to the idea of standing. That's when they the blood pools in their calves and they black out. So posture is very helpful. Provoking factors. So uh, that would be things like uh, pain or the sight of blood or uh, nausea and vomiting. Vomiting is a profound vagal stimulus and will uh, often cause a bradycardia. Uh, can be quite a profound bradycardia and can make you vasovagal. Uh, and the prodrome, really important that these patients have warning that they're going to black out. They don't suddenly 
keel over while they're standing. They know that they're going to faint. They might not be able to do something about it quickly enough to stop themselves from fainting. And so patients, they need to be referred for cardiology unless, and it's uh, really clear that they're, it, it's a slightly funny way that NICE put this because they sort of describe, refer all patients with transient loss of consciousness. And then they give exceptions of the vast majority of patients with transient loss of consciousness. So if patients have got an uncomplicated faint, vasovagal type faint, or they've got situational syncope like it's our post micturition syncope or orthostatic hypotension, these patients do not need to have further assessment. And obviously, if they've got epilepsy, they don't need to have a cardiology assessment. What about the symptoms that you look for in patients who've got a cardiac arrhythmia? So you've probably come across uh, Ericsson during the Denmark uh, football game of the European Cup who collapsed. Uh, so what, what would you say are the features that make you think of a cardiac arrhythmia? <coughs> And this could be a tachyarrhythmia or a bradyarrhythmia. So these are the Stokes Adams type attacks. These are the lack of prodrome, uh, the lack of a provoking factor. You're playing in a football game, minding your own business. It's nearly half time and you suddenly fall flat on your face without putting your hands out to protect yourself. Um, these patients often have uh, an injury because they go down like uh, you know absolutely flat down on their face uh, but they rapidly regain consciousness after the episode um, so how do we go about investigating patients we think have got cardiac arrhythmias well if a, i see a patient in clinic who's having episodes of what sound like syncope but you know they're maybe once every six months or so i wouldn't want to bring that person into hospital um, and I probably wouldn't be able to find anything particularly useful with just a period of halter monitoring but it can be worth doing a 24-48 hour tape just to get a baseline often if people are having pauses long enough to make them black out there'll be something shorter suggestive of it on a 12 on a, a 48 hour ECG and obviously if my 12 lead ECG is abnormal and they've got classic cardiac syncope, I can just put a pacemaker in rather than messing around with monitoring. Um, if the episodes are, are infrequent, as less than every few weeks, then a loop recorder, we can implant its tiny little device um, at, that fits under the skin, it's injected and uh, sits under the skin over the chest wall and has a battery life of about three years and that can look out for anything, any bradyarrhythmias. or tachyarrhythmias. So it can be a really good way of following up cardiac arrhythmias. And what we absolutely need in these patients is symptom rhythm correlation. So I don't want to look at the loop recorder and see a five second pause and not know if that was symptomatic or not. I want to know if that would cause them to black out. And equally, if they black out, I need them to tell me exactly when it was so I can look at their ECG and say, actually, your ECG was completely normal during that specific 10 minute episode that caused you to black out and so therefore rule out a cardiac cause. Other investigations, so we can do loads and loads of other tests for, uh, for blackouts and one of the common ones is a tilt table test. Has any of you watched a tilt table test? I spent a year doing tilt table tests every Tuesday morning and I must say it was one of the less pleasant years of Tuesday mornings of my life. I think it was only six months I had to do it for but it felt like a year and the problem is that so many of these patients don't have any symptoms until they get GTN spray under their tongue and then they black out and everybody blacks out when they've been standing still for 45 minutes and are given a squirt of GTN spray under their tongue. They do actually carry a small risk of a stroke, so it's not to be taken lightly, um, but uh, they, they can help confirm the diagnosis, but they by and large are not very helpful. <clears throat> um, and 
the other oh, so that's a further advice about the tilt table tests and the carotid sinus massage is something that you can think about in patients particularly over the age of 60 but i used to do that in clinic i used to rub on their carotids while i felt their uh, their uh, femoral pulse and and that's not the way to do it anymore you uh, should do it with monitoring with the resuscitation equipment because they can have quite scary long pauses bear in mind that there is a small risk of you know less than one about one in a thousand of causing a stroke when you do that don't do it if they've got carotid bruise but carotid bruise don't really correlate with the presence of carotid atheroma so uh, do just bear in mind the risks and it, it is pretty rare to have carotid sinus uh, hypersensitivity so they patients can be referred for uh, carotid sinus massage rather than you trying to do it yourself what information do you give your patient who's had a blackout So, you know, imagine, thank you, Rebecca. So be aware of potential triggers, absolutely. So if you know what's caused it, let's say it's a vasovagal syncope, then you could give them the talk that I just mentioned about the gentleman who's been down the pub. Uh, so tell them about the potential triggers and explain to them how to avoid them, very good. Uh, you want to explain the condition, whatever it is that's that's doing it, but imagine it is something like a vasovagal episode. What else do you need to do? What else do you need to inform them about? <clears throat> Driving, very good. So what do we tell the patient who's had a vasovagal syncope who gets up in the morning, goes to make him uh, have herself a cup of tea and then blacks out with minimal warning that she's going to do so. She goes a bit lightheaded, tries to sit down, misses the chair and blacks out on the floor for five minutes, she thinks. So what advice do you give her about driving? Don't. <laughs> so if you're not sure, then to advise them not to drive until they've had specialist assessment. Just, just bear in mind that the waiting list for special, specialist assessment can be pretty long. Uh, so having some sort of an idea about uh, driving advice can be really useful. Um, Advise them how to uh, be safe at work. So if they work with uh, power tools, uh, they say they're a carpenter and they use circular saws on a regular basis, that obviously would be a big concern. And similarly advise them about not going up ladders at home and being careful on the stairs. Um, there is uh, the DVLA assessing fitness to drive. And if you Google, um, uh, at a glance, DVLA, it'll pull this up. Uh, has every, everybody seen this document? It's actually, it's a really, really good document. It is quite regularly updated, so I do tend to check it out whenever I'm dealing with something, particularly if I haven't dealt with it recently. And it's separated out into different chapters for different types of blackout. Uh, the Things like uh, a transient loss of consciousness actually tend to come under neurological disorders rather than under uh, cardiovascular disorders. And if you look at them, then the can you see here there are lots of obviously different types of transient loss of consciousness, so you have to go different places for it. But the key question here is, do they drive a car and motorbike? or are they an H group two HGV driver or a bus driver that the rules are very, very much stricter about. Now, if they have a typical vasovagal syncope while standing, unless they drive while standing, they're unlikely to get it while driving. And if they know what 
to avoid. So, you know, if it's midsummer, they need to be very careful about getting into their car to drive when they are uh, dehydrated and the car is extremely hot. Uh, but providing it's only occurring while standing, they may drive and need not notify the DVLA. Vasovagal syncope while sitting, on the other hand, uh, there's the question of was there an avoidable trigger? Um, and they mustn't drive until their annual risk of recurrence is assessed as below 20%. So if they've got typical vasovagal syncope, very often there isn't an issue if they just drive a car about, about driving. On the other hand, if they have unexplained syncope, then that requires six months off driving. So unexplained syncope is a long time off driving. If a patient has a pacemaker put in, then they mustn't drive for one week. If they've had a pacemaker put in because of syncope, so they could have had complete heart block but not have syncope, that would be one week. But if they've got syncope and the pacemaker has been put in because of that, then they mustn't drive for four weeks. So that's important guidance to be putting on the discharge letters. And that really should be the responsibility of the person doing the procedure. If ever you see my name on a procedure and it's not on there, please give me a ticking off because I'm making a point of trying to remember to do that and have been for the last uh, six months or so. Great. So I think that's probably all I wanted to say. Uh, just as a summary, remember the Taking a good history is absolutely essential here. So uh, just think through, uh, ask about things like the prodrome, get uh, some a witness to tell you what happened, um, ask how quickly they recovered about previous episodes, what they were doing at the time. And remember the red flags that require urgent referral and particularly things like family history of sudden cardiac death or exertional syncope, which shouldn't happen. Feeling lightheaded after exercise, that's relatively common, but during exercise, you shouldn't have uh, syncope or pre-syncope. Um, cardiac referral, unless it's the obvious cause that is non-serious. Um, epilepsy certainly is present and it's out there, but it is overdiagnosed. Um, and don't forget to give the driving advice. Thank you very much. Are there any questions?